What do you think has become of the young and old men? And what do you think has become of the women and children? They are alive and well somewhere. The smallest sprout shows there is really no death, and if ever there was, it led forward life and does not wait at the end to arrest it and cease the moment life appeared. All goes onward and outward, and nothing collapses, and to die is different from what anyone supposed and luckier. Has anyone supposed it lucky to be born? I hasten to inform him or her it is just as lucky to die, and I know it. I pass death with the dying, and birth with the new washed babe, and I'm not contained between my hat and boots, and peruse manifold objects, no two alike, and every one good. The earth good, and the stars good, and their adjuncts all good. I am not an earth, nor an adjunct of an earth. I am the mate and companion of people, all just as immortal and fathomless as myself. They do not know how immortal, but I know. Dear Dream Foundation, my name is Shizuka Brainerd. I'm 95 years old. So on a weekly basis, we take brand new dreams that come into us, um, and we read their letters out loud. Whichever letter really speaks to somebody, they grab the dream and, and fulfill it. I like to read the stories. Some people have very simple dreams, but it means a lot to them and they want to explain themselves, while others just are right to the point and this is what I need in order to feel accomplished, in order to close the chapter, to be okay with the passing that's coming. It's an honor just to be able to work on this type of request for somebody. You know, it's something that's so deep and personal to them and something they've obviously given a lot of thought to. So just being part of it is a huge honor to me. It's a pleasure. Um, yeah, I get a lot of joy out of it. All of the dreams really are carefully chosen by the dream coordinators. They take what they want to work on, but every dream finds a home every week. A lot of our dream recipients, there's a lot of things that they still wish they could have done, and that's essentially what we're doing, is fulfilling their final dreams. So it's really just made me think a lot about death, and it's a topic that we don't normally speak about, and just living life to the fullest and really appreciating what you have in the present moment. The simplest one is still the one that chokes me up. And this, this was for a man in his 80s. And he had four kids. He worked two to three jobs his whole life. And he came to us with his dream to eat in a restaurant with white tablecloth where he would get served at the table because he has never been able to do that his whole life. He worked so hard, he provided for his family and never allowed himself a treat of a dinner in a restaurant where he would get served. And to me, that is still like the core of what this is all about, to make these just heartfelt moments happen for our dream recipients and for their family. My name is David Samora. I am 35 years old. In May 2016, I was diagnosed with stage 3 testicular germ cell cancer. These past six months have been really rough. I have days when I ask myself if this fight against cancer is worth it. It's those rough days when I have to remind myself who I do this for. I have two little girls who mean the world to me. I would love to be able to take my girls to Alani Resort in Hawaii. I can't think of anyone else I'd like to make this trip with than my girls. I don't know how much time I have left on this earth, but what I do know is that I want to make sure my girls have everlasting memories of me with me. They are my reason for living. So it's very emotional when you deliver a dream to a patient because these dreams are something that they've thought about, something that they want to do with their family or their children. 
You will have feelings and emotions that you never even knew that you had when you deliver a dream and you hear the stories of these people. When you're sitting there and you're looking someone in the eyes and holding their hand, you put yourself in, in their position. I think it just humbles you so much to know what one small thing, what impact that that can make on, on people's lives. Many of them are in the fight for their life. And, you know, to be a little part of that journey, to bring some, to, um, some happiness and some joy in that fight is, it's indescribable. When Phil came in, it was my first introduction to a homeless person that I fell in love with because he was an amazing, gentle soul. A 45-year-old homeless man living on the streets with colon cancer. He said he had a sister and he hadn't seen her in probably seven years. And they had lost their mother quite young. And his dream was, I just wish I could talk to my sister. Dream Foundation not only found her, but flew her from Las Vegas to Santa Barbara within 48 hours. And she was able to get closure and really, I think, give peace to Phil as he took his last breath that same evening. Because we don't know when we'll die, we get to think of life as an inexhaustible well. Yet everything happens only a certain number of times, and a very small number, really. How many more times will you remember a certain afternoon of your childhood? An afternoon that is so deeply a part of your being that you can't even conceive of your life without it. Perhaps four or five more? Perhaps not even that. How many more times will you watch the full moon rise? Perhaps 20. And yet, it all seems limitless. The first thing that everybody says is, how are you? which is fine, but it gives a lot of, a big spotlight on the disease. Whatever that disease is, everybody's asking, how are you? Are you in pain? Are you comfortable? You almost forget there's a person much bigger than that disease. And my whole everything that I learned through Phil was there was a person that wanted something. And it wasn't for me to ask him, how are you? Or are you pain free? Or can I make you more comfortable? He, he had something in his heart that he just needed to release and to have someone hold for him, a dream. It was actually good for me to write down this vacation we wanted to do. You know, it gave me a goal going forward to fight. We've been planning this trip for over three years. And originally, it was a two week long road trip we just decided to be bluntly honest and to tell them everything up front that I was given three months to live and, you know, we wanted to teach them about death, that it's part of living, that we're all going to die, and that uh, the way we live and the way we die is important, you know, says a lot about who we are. When you're young, you have just unrestricted joy with certain things, and that's something that we lose when we get older, and so it's so much fun to watch. We've had enough things to, I've been hard this year. That's the part I wanna see. I wanna see their happiness, and I wanna see their joy. I didn't expect my family to enjoy it as much as they did. Everyone enjoyed it on their own unique level as a person. All the nighttime animals, you could hear them and the insects. If you do have the chance to be humbled by, by nature, you, you really realize that, yes, I'm small, but, I, but I'm not insignificant. Dream Foundation is making a difference in people's lives and families' lives like mine. And I think they really believe in what they're doing and helping people like me who might be running out of time to have one last experience, positive experience of memory building with their family. 
It has long been my dream to show a comprehensive retrospective of my life's work. A show of my paintings would allow me to present for myself, my family, and others in my community the efforts to reflect the world in my art. My work has never received such a generous opportunity before, and it would be a meaningful way for me to celebrate my life's work before I die. Leanne and I met in uh, May of 1980. She was my sister's best friend. We moved 19 times through 11 states, uh, served five submarines and three ships, and built a family and served our country. We were just as much in love after 30 years as we were after our first year. Leanne's dream was uh, really to go to Hawaii, put her feet in the ocean, kick back, and, and just enjoy the, really the, the wonders of Hawaii. Leanne's health was starting to sort of wane a little bit, so they gave us the next best thing, which was a, was a beautiful stay in California. I have to live with myself and live without my, my best friend and, and my soulmate. I look back and I think, did I make a difference? That, you know, what, what could I have done differently? And I look at those three days, and I'm so happy about those days. I'm thinking, those days were great days, and, and Dream Foundation helped me do that. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of rain are moving across the landscapes over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination. Calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. I'm a 68-year-old Vietnam vet suffering with terminal kidney cancer, which has spread throughout my body. They found that I have cancer tumors in my stomach and a large tumor in my colon. I have a wonderful family and it's going to be hard to let them go. I would like to visit the War Memorial in Washington, D.C. with a fellow vet, Mr. Ed Kurtz. While I was in Vietnam, I witnessed deceased vets being removed from cargo planes for processing. I feel that even though I do not know all their names, I would somehow connect with them by just touching the wall. Arlen Edwards served our nation for over a decade. Her request was so simple. She wanted a small gift to go and buy new clothes so that she could attend veterans events and a reunion with some of her old uh, Navy shipmates. I was specifically drawn to the work of Dreams for Veterans. Uh, being a veteran myself, my father was a veteran, um, my grandfather uh, was a veteran. He lived most of his life never talking about his service uh, as many from his generation did. One of the experiences that stands out in my mind is the launch for Dreams for Veterans. Being involved with Dreams for Veterans, for me, is about that acknowledgement. I had the pleasure of meeting James and Sherry, who were there in memory of uh, their husband and father. My father's name was Jim Malone. He served in the U.S. Navy. That was his crowning achievement of his life. He was very patriotic. Um, you know, there's a Toby Keith song about, you know, buying things in the store with a Made in America tag on them. He was that kind of guy. He had never gotten the opportunity to take me to Washington, D.C. So he wanted to meet up with the rest of his family from the East Coast with me in Washington, D.C. and just, you know, tour the museums, go to the National Mall, and just, you know, bask in the country's history. 
Watching my dad's reaction to, you know, hearing that his dream was going to be fulfilled is to this day one of the most important memories I have of my dad because it was one of the last times I saw a real genuine smile on his face. It was such a touching experience and really what it showed me was the power of dreams not only for the actual recipient but for the family that's left behind. In that case James, the recipient, wasn't able to join us. He passed away shortly before the launch it was a surreal feeling because I was really nervous about it because I didn't know how I'd feel about going without him. But being there, it just brought back so many memories of, you know, the good times with my dad. My name is Randall Rios. I'm 62 years old. In May of 2012, I was diagnosed with colon cancer. I had an operation and I went through extensive chemotherapy treatment and I was cancer free. After two years, my doctors informed me that the cancer had returned and was spreading. The doctors have been exceptional. They never give up. But I, on the other hand, have decided enough is enough. I'm only human and I can't take it anymore. I just want to live out my natural life however it will be. I played music for most of my life. I played in Lahaina, Maui for 10 years with my music partner, but in those 10 years we never recorded anything we had done together. We were just having fun. My dream is to go into a studio and record a simple CD of our favorite songs. I'd love to hear what we sound like in a studio with proper sound equipment and maybe some professional backup musicians. I just want something to leave behind as a memento, as a reminder of, yes, I was here. Please remember me this way. How lovely to think that no one need wait a moment. We can start now, start slowly changing the world. How lovely that everyone, great and small, can make their contribution toward introducing justice straight away. And you can always, always give something, even if it is only kindness. In March 2016, doctors told me the HIV virus my body had harbored since the mid-1980s had officially crossed the threshold. Their prognosis for AIDS wasting syndrome was six months to a year. These days, which I can feel are growing fewer, have connected me with a deep desire to direct one more play. Doing so would allow me and the patrons of the show to process end of life and the small deaths that occur along the way. It would give me one more sweet taste of the joy I knew directing Richard II, Richard III, Taming of the Shrew, and more. And it would allow a new audience to ponder points raised by Samuel Beckett's Happy Days. Denise had a very special and unique relationship with Dominic. She was unable to have children of her own, so she was very close with him. She was 26 years old when um, she got a diagnosis of ovarian cancer. Denise had said, you know, Dominic's favorite movie is Back to the Future. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have the DeLorean come to the house? I've never seen a smile on her face like that in probably six months. The excitement on his face, I think she was really holding on for so long, just to have a great memory with him. Geronimo, my grandfather, swine herder and storyteller, feeling death about to arrive and take him, went and said goodbye to the trees in the yard, embracing them and crying, because he knew he wouldn't see them again. To truly appreciate life, we must remember that nothing lasts forever and take nothing we enjoy for granted. I've been on oxygen for COPD for six years. I've known that it would eventually kill me, but though it slowed me down, it didn't keep me down. Last August, I went skydiving. It had been on my bucket list and I was beginning to feel that if I waited much longer, my body would not be able to skydive. 
served in Vietnam in the American Red Cross in a program formerly known as Supplemental Recreation Aid Overseas. More commonly, we were known as the Donut Dollies, a term given to all the women who served in World War II who followed the men all over Europe serving coffee and donuts out of retrofitted ambulances. I want to thank you for one of the great adventures of my lifetime, doing aerobatics in a glider. My original wish was to fly in a hot air balloon, but the flames and my oxygen wasn't a good fit. The glider flight was even more exciting. It was glorious. We're all going to die, all of us. What a circus. That alone should make us love each other, but it doesn't. We are terrorized and flattened by trivialities. We are eaten up by nothing. There is nothing to mourn about death any more than there is to mourn about the growing of a flower. What is terrible is not death, but the lives people live or don't live up until their death. Ron loved bicycles. His entire life, he was a cyclist. He just, he loved it. He had heard that there was this new thing that was called a motored bicycle, and he wouldn't even have to pedal as hard. He had lung cancer. He was so thin, 70 pounds probably, could barely walk. Literally, it's like a movie. The front doors to Sarah House open up, right? We have French doors. And out he stands and, and out comes this young man who is the owner of this company that makes this super expensive $5,000 bicycle that is like the cream of the crop for Ron. And he knows all about it. And he sees it and he starts crying and he tells the guy, oh man, you got me the best thing on the market. And he literally gets on it and just goes down that tiny little hill. And he's just like, wow, best dream, you know? Now, mind you, this young man was just going to bring the bike for him to look at it, and then the, the idea was he was going to take it back to the factory or wherever the bike came from. But Ron gets off the bike, and he goes, all right, I'm going to go put it in my room now. <laughs> and we're all kind of like, uh. <laughs> And then the young guy goes, it's okay. Let him keep it. So Ron walks the bike to his room. Ron puts the bike on his bed because the bike deserves the bed. <laughs> and Ron begins to sleep on his recliner for the next three nights. On the third day, Ron begins to die. And then he says, where's my bike? And I say, it's on the bed, Ron, it's on the bed. And then he goes, all right, <laughs> my God. <laughs> I want you to know that that bike gave me the best wind of my life. I can't believe I got such an amazing present. You tell that young man, I loved it. His next thing is, you, you don't move my bike from my bed, okay? Until I die, I want my bike there with me. As I go, that bike is gonna take me to heaven and I'm gonna ride it all the way to heaven. And then I said, and you won't even have to pedal. <laughs> and then he said, don't be silly. My lungs will be perfect then. I'm going to pedal the hell out of that bike. <laughs> that evening, he began to die. It was a beautiful afternoon in Santa Barbara. The door was open. There was this lovely breeze. Uh, myself and one of my staff members were sitting there with him as he took his final breath. And, and I remember just looking at him and looking at the bike and thinking, this is absolutely absurd and beautiful and who would have thought that having a bike on a bed would make 100% sense? But it did. At that moment, all of it made sense. It's a beautiful, beautiful dream. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, Small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. 
Our memory suddenly sharpened examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die, and our reality, bound to them, takes leave of us. Our souls, dependent upon their nurture, now shrink, wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, fall away. And when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Space is filled with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses, restored, never to be the same, whisper to us. They existed. They existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. <laughs>